Yuma, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the National Library of Australia. Uh, I'm Luke Hickey, I'm the Assistant Director General of the Library's Engagement Branch. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Australia's First Nations people as the traditional owners and custodians of this land and give my respects to Elders past and present and through them to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Thank you for attending this event. Uh, for those of you who've braved the weather and come in from outside, uh, and also for those of you who are joining us online on our stream, uh, we're coming to you from Ngunnawal and Nambri country. The library has custodianship over rich collections documenting the experiences, culture and language of First Nations people. Whilst our collections have been collected and created by Indigenous and non-Indigenous people alike, the library recognises First Nations people are the primary guardians, interpreters and decision makers of their heritage and with deep cultural connections and authoritative values and perspectives. Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations people are advised that this presentation contains content that may be culturally sensitive. Please be aware that you may see or hear certain words or descriptions that reflect the attitudes of the historical period in which they were spoken, written or created, and that may now be considered offensive. This afternoon's presentation, Living with the Dead, Exploring First Nations Settler Relations Through the Lens of Mortality in Colonial Australia, is by Professor Paul Turnbull, a 2022 National Library of Australia Fellow. Our Distinguished Fellowships programs supports researchers to make intensive use of the National Library's rich and varied collections through residencies of three months. These fellowships are made possible by the generous philanthropic support and Professor Turnbull's fellowship is supported by the Stokes family, who we're very grateful for their support. Paul Turnbull is an emer emeritus professor at the University of Tasmania, holds an honorary professorial appointment with the Centre for Critical Heritage and Museum Studies of the Australian National University. He is known internationally for his research and for writing on the theft, scientific uses and repatriation of the ancestral bodily remains of Australia's First Nations and other Indigenous peoples. Paul tells us that over the past 20 years, the collections of the National Library have been essential in enabling this valuable research. His 2017 book, Science, Museums and Collecting the Indig Indigenous Dead in Colonial Australia, has won acclaim for demonstrating that no effort at deciding on the present and future of museum collections of human remains can ignore serious historical research. Since the early 1990s, Paul has served as a consultant researcher for Indigenous Australian representative organisations, Australian and overseas museums, and recently the Australian Government's International Repatriation Program. In his presentation today, Professor Turnbull will share some of his findings from the library's rich and largely unexamined visual and documentary records of settler encounters with and reactions to First Nation burial places. Among other things, he has sought to explore how relations between First Nation and settler communities and rural and remote colonial Australia were influenced by the presence of the Indigenous dead. Please join me in welcoming Professor Taylor. Uh, Turnbull, sorry. Thank you. Is this, is, this is on? It's on. Good. You, you can hear me okay? Good, good. Great. Um, I want to begin by saying that I'm conscious that I stand on Nungawal and Nambri country. Uh, I guess I, now I'm an elder in my own community, that's uh, Historians of Australia, and I offer my greetings to the elders of the Nungawal and Nambri people. I hold in esteem these men and women of high degree, past and present, for ensuring the vitality, well-being and confidence of the generations to come. They, in their turn, will care for Nongawal and Nambri ancestral country, the ancient sovereignty of which has never been ceded, and its country which is a source of life for us all. It's also hard for me to say in a few words um, to, to express my gratitude to the Stokes family for the trust they put in me to advance our shared aspirations to see we Australians, um, we peoples of very diverse ancestries and cultures, know more about our history. To be able to spend three months immersed in the collections of the National Library, um, as William Blake would say, to swim in the tide of time, 
That's a rare gift for which um, I will ever be thankful. And of course, I'd like to thank the staff of the library, um, especially um, Rebecca, Kelly, Sharon, Catherine, Andrew and Adrian, uh, and all of the, engage the Indigenous engagement team who have been unfailingly helpful in what, um, at the moment, are challenging times. Challenging times? Well, um, I just want to say in a personal capacity, as someone who's been a reader in this library um, since 1979 and has seen the library um, change, grow over the years, someone who's also written about the library's remarkable achievements in fostering knowledge and understanding of our history and the histories of our neighbours in Asia and Oceania. The National Library has been a world leader in providing access to knowledge essential for our understanding and addressing the great challenges of our times. It sought to provide us with resources to understand that many of our greatest challenges have deep historical roots. But it's been a victim of neglect. I would dare even as goes as far as to say ignorance on the part of our elected leaders for far too many years now. This must change. I hasten to add that these are my personal views and certainly not the view of the library itself. I want to talk for about 40 minutes to share some of the findings of my research. It's a talk. It's not a lecture. Um, it's not a prepared um, script, as it were, that will, um, has already been sent off for publication. I'm still trying to work through um, all of the things that I have encountered over the last three months, and I'm going to try and at least leave a fair bit of time for kind of commentary, questions, and, and maybe debate about some of these findings. I want to start off um, by um, talking about this memorial. Now, some of you will have visited Camperdown. Uh, it's a rural town in southwestern Victoria. It's a town with an interesting history. If you've been there, you perhaps visited the town cemetery. If you have been to the cemetery, you could hardly fail to notice that in the centre of the cemetery there's this striking memorial. It takes the form of a seven-metre obelisk. The memorial bears the inscription, In memory of the Aborigines of this district, here lies the body of the chief, Wombich Poyan, and last of the local tribes, 1840 to 1883. Now, Wombich Piyum, or Umbete Poyan, as we find him referred to in other sources, was better known to settlers in the district as Camperdown George. Wombich Piyan was imagined at that time, at the time of his death, wrongly, of course, to have been among the last of the Jadawarung people. Certainly, by no means, was he the last. The memorial um, was erected by one James Dawson. Dawson was a Scot by birth who arrived in the Port Phillip district in 1840. Now, with money that he'd acquired on the gold fields, he bought land near Camperdown, probably around about 18, in the mid-1880s. Now, Dawson took a keen interest in the Jadawarung people, the sovereign owners of this part of Western Victoria. In 1881, he published a book-length uh, book ethnographic study of the First Nations of the Western District of Victoria. Uh, there are copies here in the library. Also, remarkably, there are a couple of reprint copies out at um, um, uh, Cantley's Books in Fishwick. Um, the book's entitled Australian Aborigines, the languages and customs of several tribes of Aborigines in the Western District of Victoria, Australia. Dawson, however, um, was also very concerned for local Jadawarung people's welfare in the wake of dispossession. In 1876, he sought and was appointed, it seems without much or any opposition, uh, he was appointed to the Office of Protector of Aborigines for the Camperdown District. Now, from the outset, he was critical of the government's removal of Jadawarung people to a reserve at Framlington near Warrnambool which was originally run by Anglican missionaries. They abandoned it, leaving it to government to run. And we find him voicing his criticisms of the way that the Jadawarung people were being treated before a royal commission on the condition of Aborigines in Victoria 
which was held in 1877. As he told the commission about the Jadawarung families that have been forcibly removed from Framlington, in dealing with them, my long experience and full possession of their confidence enabled me to state that it's a mistake to imagine that they are not fully aware of the position uh, of the occupation of their country by the white man and the position it's placed them in, and they have strong claims uh, on them for proper maintenance and protection. They are very sensitive on this point and assert that they are entitled to be well housed, well clothed and well fed in consideration for the loss of their hunting ground. And they ought not to be called upon to work on the Aboriginal farm without fair wages. This is the Aboriginal farm that was down at Framlington. They are um, without fair wages any more than a hired white labourer. Well, so argued um, Dawson. It seems, however, that there were a few Jadawarang men who um, were left at Camperdown. They lived doing chores for small amounts of money uh, on local properties. Dawson was naturally concerned for their well-being. He had a hut built for them to see them through the winter. He ensured that they had enough to eat and that they had clothing to keep warm during the colder months of winter. And among these men was one bitch point. He was only 43 when he died in 1883. As with other Jadawarang who lived at Camperdown, he was buried in the so-called black section of the cemetery reserve, on the far edge of the burial ground, well away from white graves, in boggy scrub. And I think this is one of the kind of um, issues that um, I've, I've come to explore in greater, or been alerted to going through the sources, is the extent um, to which we would do well um, to think about how we deal um, with situations such as that which led to the burial of a um, Wombich Poyan. Returning from a visit to Scotland after Wombich Poyan's death, Dawson was appalled to learn how he'd been buried. He was determined to give him a decent burial. Indeed, he envisaged his grave as memorialising both Wombich Poyan and the Jada Warren, whom Dawson in the racialized imaginary of the time, believed were doomed, wrongly believed, were doomed to extinction. This seven metre obelisk and its base was sculptured in Geelong. And it was erected on a plot bought by Dawson in the center of Camperdown Cemetery, to which he personally removed the remains of Wombich Poyon. Now it cost Dawson more than 185 pounds this was no small sum of money in the 1880s. And Dawson sought to defray the cost of the memorial by approaching the wealthier landowners in the Camperdown district for subscriptions. As he was to recall in a letter to the Australian Town and Country Journal a year or so after burying Wombich Poyan, in response to my applications, he wrote, for contributions to the memorial, Gratifying and sympathetic replies accompanied with subscriptions were sent to me by many landowners, all of olden time. But Dawson found that not every established landowner in the district was so generous. As he also informed the uh, Town and Country Journal, and I quote, from eight others owning vast estates valued in the aggregate of upwards of 850,000 pounds sterling, he had met with refusals, such as, and he lists these refusals. One, I decline to assist in erecting a monument to a race of men who we've robbed of their country. Two, your proposal does not meet with my sympathy. Three, I've always looked on the blacks as a nuisance and hope the trustees will forbid its erection. Four, have a strong dislike to hand over any portion of my hard-earned increment for another spend, to another, for, to another to spend. Five, I cannot see any use for it. Six, my wife wants her drawing room papered. Seven, may subscribe a little out of respect for you. And it's eight, the last one, fail to see the use. The obelisk will point for all time to come 
uh, for, uh, to our treatment of this unfortunate race. The possessors of the soil we took from them. And we gave in return the vices belonging to our boasted civilization. I decline to assist. Dawson incidentally also uh, told the paper that there were 14 fine estates in the district, the owners of which, um, of these estates, which came to over two million pounds uh, sterling in, in value, uh, did not give him one penny. And in many instances, he says, I got no replies from men holding the position of gentlemen, although they were twice written to me in a friendly spirit. Now, I found Dawson's account of his efforts to fund his memorial to Wombich Poyan and the Jada Warren shortly after I began this fellowship. And what struck me is the eighth response that Dawson received, the one that you can see here, from one of the wealthier pastoralists in the district. The respondent who was concerned that the obelisk would point for all time to come to our treatment of this unfortunate race, the possessors of the soil we took from them and we gave in return the vices belonging to our boasted civilization. Did Dawson really receive this response? We don't know. I suspect he did, but whether he did or not, the sentiments allegedly ex expressed by this unnamed pastoralist are towards one end of what I found to be a spectrum of responses to the ancestral dead of the First Nations of Southeastern Australia that are to be found in published personal reminiscences of settlers and in books and journals published during the last 30 or so years of the 19th century. Many of these books are only available in the collections of the National Library of Australia. Now, the care with which First Nation communities remembered the dead in their ancestral country is confirmed by a remarkable wealth of written and visual sources by colonial observers in various walks of life. And many of these sources, again, are to be found in the National Library of Australia. Among them are the reminiscences of Gideon, one Gideon Scott Lang, who was a Scottish-born pastoralist um, who was at, uh, settled at Nambool, south of the modern-day city of Ballarat in Victoria. Lang wrote of participating in a punitive raid in the 1830s against men of the Watarung nation, uh, the land's sovereign owners, in retaliation for allegedly killing two white shepherds. The raid, which undoubtedly would have resulted in the massacre of innocent Watarung people, was prevented by them being discovered when honouring the dead. Lang was later to write that uh, they, the Wadarongo were found, and I quote, to have peculiar chants, which they sing in honour of the recently dead, generally just before daybreak. And some of these are very touching. I was told an instance of this by a gentleman who formed one of the party uh, uh, who went out in pursuit of a tribe, among whom were the murderers of these two shepherds. They reached the black camp before dawn, and while waiting for daybreak, one of the natives rose, lit a fire, and commenced to sing one of the chants for the dead. Almost immediately afterwards, one fire was lit, and one voice joined another, until a line of fires gleamed down along the edge of the scrub, and the whole tribe joined in this melancholy dirge. A hurried consultation took place, during which one of the party urged that whether the blacks sang at daybreak or not, the shepherds had been nonetheless murdered. But imagination carried the day against the matter of fact, and the party crept back to their horses and gave up the attack. Now, some of you may know that Lang's account was also, incidentally, to inspire Judith Wright, um, and it provides the title for her um, brilliant 1981 telling of the story of her family in the context of the history of, pastor, of the pastoral invasion of Australia. Um, Cry for the Dead. Um, if you haven't read it, please get a copy and do so. Um, it is a magnificent book. Now, many similar first-hand testimonies confirming uh, that burials and their surroundings were sacred places they required strict observance of custom, respecting their creation, visitation, and preservation. One typical testimony is that of Emma McPherson, which is to be found 
in her published recollections of managing a sheep station in the New England district of northern New South Wales in the 1860s. McPherson tells of how shortly after she and her husband, Alan, arrived to take over running the station, they learned that a burial place uh, of a clan of the Camilleroy people, the land's sovereign owners, lay a short distance from the station's homestead. After several fruitless attempts to find it, they tried to persuade um, one of the elders of the clan to reveal its whereabouts. McPherson recalled that, and I quote, he shuddered and literally turned pale when we broached the subject. But the McPhersons persisted, questioning him as to which of his former acquaintances were there interred. Eventually, the elder gave in. Traditional food sources were now scarce due to intensive grazing by sheep. The men and women of the clan, the children of the clan, were dependent upon the men and women doing work on the station in return for rations of flour and the occasional butchered sheep. Making sure that none but Macpherson and her husband heard, the elder whispered the names of the dead, and I quote, scarcely above his breath, at the same time looking around fearfully. The Macphersons similarly pressured younger Camilleroy men working on the station, one of whom agreed to guide them to within a kilometre or so of the site, where, we are told, he stopped abruptly, pointed with his hand to a very tall tree some few yards off, and darted away like an arrow, unwilling to linger near the spot. The Macphersons walked on to discover a number of burial mounds surrounded by trees adorned with intricate carvings. One, in particular, bore the appearance of being tended with no little care, Mrs. Macpherson was to recall. And both the Macphersons were struck, and I quote, that however much they dislike to name the dead or visit their last abodes, they do not allow the tombs of their friends and family to suffer from neglect. And here we have an illustration which is to be found in uh, Macpherson's experiences in Australia. Now, the Macphersons, incidentally, were in no physical danger in visiting these burials, although local Camilleroy people, I suspect, would have lamented that the white boss and his missus had put themselves in serious spiritual danger by transgressively intruding on the dead. Sickness and misfortune would surely follow. But in many parts of the country of, in, in the mid-19th century, uh, in, there were First Nation communities, of course, who were still in control of and able to defend their ancestral country from white occupation. Settlers uh, who were discovered trespassing on burials in those parts of the country, in frontier regions, ran a serious risk of being killed. As colonial settlements spread across the Australian continent during the 19th and the first decades of the 20th century, the rights and obligations of First Nations to care and protect the dead were generally ignored. Lawrence Strulby, a native of Ulster, who managed a sheep station on the plains west of Bathurst in the late 1830s, was to recall in later memoirs asking one local Wiradjuri uh, elder to assist in getting possums to skin for a winter coat. The elder is said to have replied, and I quote, yes, yes, you white men gallop horses over my father's graves. You white men come on my hunting grounds and eat my possums. But if I eat the white man's sheep or heifer, he'll hang me or he'll shoot me. You fool, fool, but come over the sea and want more, more, more. Now, what I find noteworthy about this um, recollection is that this Wiradjuri elder should first and foremost speak of the white man's disregard for the sanctity of his ancestral burial places as among the gravest offences committed in their invasion of Wiradjuri country. Burials were not just ridden over. They were destroyed when land was cleared of native shrubs and trees to run sheep or cattle, or to enable the ploughing of cereals and other crops. Mounds marking, burial, uh, marking earth burials were flattened. In regions where communities laid the dead to rest on burial platforms, these structures were lost in the felling of trees. Sometimes the destruction was inadvertent. Other times, 
it was knowingly done. Wanton destruction of burial places also troubled some settlers. Among them was James DeMar, who had published reminiscences of travelling in southeastern Australia between 1839 and 1844, decried what he saw as the inevitable desecration of burial places. He spoke in particular of burial places, uh, burial grounds at Mil, Mil, Mil Meridian near Nyangan in southwest New South Wales, which had been first been encountered by the Surveyor General uh, Thomas Mitchell um, on his second ex survey expedition of 1835. DeMar wrote, and I quote, did the colonial government at that time or the white settlers do anything to protect and preserve in the interest of the black natives these simple but touching records of humanity? Although I have no direct proof that they did not, I am certain and as sure as I am of writing this that nothing of the kind would be done. This district would in a short time be occupied as cattle or sheep stations, and this burial ground, which these blacks would be wishful to visit occasionally, perhaps to decorate, in their own unconventional way and shed tears over would be trampled over, desecrated and destroyed and they would be driven away and by a people calling themselves Christians. These civilized whites care nothing about the blacks when living and they were not likely to care about them when dead or their burial grounds either. But, however, there were settlers who avoided um, desecrating burial places, knowing that they were subject to observances of custom and ritual governing their creation, visitation, and preservation. Often they learnt of First Nation obligations firsthand to care for the dead and their resting places by actually attending funerals of dependent men, of, the, of dependents of men and women who had worked as stockmen or domestics on stations. Saul Samuel held pastoral lands in the Wellington district of western New South Wales between 1841 and 1852. At a meeting of London's Royal Colonial Institute in the 1890s, as an old man, he recalled being approached by local Wiradjuri men on the death of a man known to the whites on the station as Jackie, who was said to have been an especial favourite with the white men as well as his own people. Samuel told how he was asked to provide a barrow to take the dead man to his burial. Asking why they wished to use a barrow rather than carrying him to the grave, the men allegedly replied that they wished to follow the custom of the white people in using a dray as a hearse. Well, Samuel lent them a barrow, and the deceased was wheeled to the grave. Saul, um, Samuel, went on to, uh, Samuel went on to explain that when we were approaching um, that he attended the funeral, and I believe he had um, uh, to, that he was now being buried by people whom he, who really loved him. And Samuel adds, and I quote, I must mention that when we were approaching his last resting place, the blacks asked the white man to retire, evidently not wishing that we should be present at their funeral, at a certain part of their mystic funeral rites. Now Samuel was in fact one of a number of pastoralists and station workers to recall actually participating, at least to some degree, in the funerary ceremonies for the dead of First Nation communities. And what is noteworthy is his reflecting on afterwards visiting the burial place and seeing its transformation into a sacred place in country, and one that testified, as he quote, as I quote him, to the Wiradjuri's, and I quote, intelligence and their good qualities. Others respected the resting places of First Nation communities out, more out of self-interest. And on this score, um, I've been put in mind by a recent observation by historian Tim Rouse in the context of discussing the strengths and weaknesses of current historiography on indigenous settler relations in Australia. And Tim Rouse suggests that there's much to be gained by seeing that by the turn of the 20th century, by the time of federation, there were in fact um, two Australias, North and South. And let me quote Rouse on this. He says, the North, in which I include the arid centre as it became available to British Australian occupation, was different. It was different in its more demanding, um, its more demanding geographies, 
in its more limited opportunities for private and public investment, in its sparser population, and in the ethnic composition of that population. Now, prior to the 1850s, across southern Australia, the viability of farming uh, sheep or cattle depended upon peaceable relations with the land's traditional owners, so as to allow pastoralists um, to exploit the labour of men and women of local clans. The desire to ensure the economic success of pastoralism through maintaining peaceable uh, relations with First Nations was undoubtedly a factor in the British Imperial Government explicitly requiring, in the case of the foundation of the new quality of colony, sorry, of South Australia, established in 1834, that land within its boundaries that was known to be used by First Nations um, for funerary purposes was to be excluded from sale or pastoral leasehold. Avoidance of trespassing on burial places occurred, however, out of necessity, um, likewise, in the Northern Territory and northwestern Queensland, especially from the from from the mid eight from the mid eighteen sixties in the case of um, uh, north in the case of northwestern Queensland and the Kimberley region, and from the eighteen eighties in the Kimberley region of northwestern Australia. Whereas by this time, um, in southern Australia responses to the presence of the dead of First Nations was now less influenced by economic necessity. And we find that, in fact, it gave rise to often very conflicting ideas and sensibilities about the destiny of Australia's First Nations. The Macphersons, I would argue, were in this respect typical of many pioneer settlers in rural and remote colonial Australia by the last third of the 19th century, in that their curiosity about indigenous culture was tempered by respect for the sanctity of burial and the belief that they were witnessing events that would be lost to history, believing, as was the prevailing view in settler society of the time, that the continent's first peoples were doomed to extinction. And the power of this extinction myth um, has been uh, investigated and written about by my colleague and friend, Russell McGregor, in what is a very important book called Imagine Destinies, Aboriginal Australians and the Doom Race Theory. Now, I've discussed elsewhere the conviction that First Nations were destined to extinction was a powerful stimulus for scientific collecting of the bodily remains of their ancestors. And as early as the 1830s, we find that the consensus in Western scientific and wider intellectual circles was, in the words of George Bennett, the first secretary and curator of Australia's, um, sort of Sydney's Australian Museum, that, and I quote Bennett, uh, Australia's natives at no distant period would be known only by name. Now, this construal of the indigenous dead as a rare and rapidly disappearing scientific resource which promised to disclose new insights into the natural history of humanity, encouraged settlers to plunder burials, to secure skulls and other remains for scientific collections, in the belief that doing so served a greater good, which absolved them uh, of what their peers, many of their peers, would have condemned as sin or moral transgression. But um, we find belief in the inevitability of First Nations extinction was also to stimulate the preservation of First Nation burial places and was to see them uh, uh, actually uh, inspire public reflection such as to imbue them with ambivalent and sometimes troubling significance. Now, we've become accustomed to talk about the great silence within Australian history about the violent dispossession of First Nations. I've always had a difficulty with that because it seems to me that when one starts looking more closely at the, um, the record, the visual records, the literary records, the historical records of the time, we find that the indigenous dead figure within popular media in southern Australia from the 1880s to the eve of the First World War. We find them there. What is more, we find what is especially noticeable is how they inspired visual imagery and poetry 
in the genre of elegy. And within this body of verse, we find people of First Nations spoken of in terms of grief and sadness that they're supposed lost, while variously attributing their passing, their demise, which of course is one of the kind of cornerstones of thinking of the time, white thinking of the time, um, they uh, variously attribute their passing to various causes, be it settler aggression, supposed incapacity for improvement, or even providence working through natural law. And what I want to share with you is some of the instances of this. Um, here we have um, an illustration, burial place of the last of the native kings of Wallerang. Um, and it's a kind of very interesting elegiac scene. Unfortunately, I can't get a better copy of this because I have to work with as good a copy um, as I can get from Trove. But the fact that I can get this via Trove, I think, is very, um, very important. This burial place of a native king, and uh, we find it's accompanied by this commentary. Our illustration represents a spot of somewhat historic interest about three miles uh, from Wallerang. The mound in the centre being the burial place of a native king, the last owner of regal authority over the tribes of the district. The nature of the place is further indicated by two trees, um, the trunks of which are covered with rude carvings by Aboriginal artists. Um, considering the character of the memorial, some steps should be taken to secure its preservation, if only by surrounding it with a stout palisading, stout fencing. It was also to inspire poetry. Poetry, um, which again re reflect, is, can, can be placed almost on a spectrum of response um, to what is believed to be um, the passing of First Nations. This poem on the grave of the last native king, um, tread lightly on that little heap of earth, for it is sacred, there is dust beneath, that from a royal chieftain drew its birth. What though no diadem or jewel it wraith, did sire to son of that black line bequeath, full many a tribe their sway bowed down before, all owned the power of one man's little breath, and of each son succeeding would implore his wisdom in their wild debate on peace or war. But we find the poem goes on um, to essentially try to engage with this question of why is it that... Uh, we should be meditating, supposedly, on the grave of the last king of the Walleran. And in this particular poem, of course, settlers are absolved from um, their complicity in the demise of the Walleran people. They've all passed. The pale-faced conqueror came. He slew them not, nor challenged them to fight. That they are gone, then can he be to blame? If more his energy and more his might, the fields he has obtained were his by right. The grain of wheat is better than Nardu. It nourishes far more, while to the sight its blade is much the fairer of the two. And should their oxen starve to feed the kangaroo? Another example from the Kapunda Herald, Northern Intelligencer, 1864. It begins, they sleep beneath the glassy springs where pensive Wirra bends their head. To every breeze that nightly sings a requiem o'er the dusky dead. And shaped in emblematic guise, each lowly mound that swells the sod seems to the passing stranger's eyes a footstep where old time hath trod. But here, interestingly, we find um, the complicity of settler society in the uh, vanishing, as it's perceived, of First Nations. Bitter your live streams ebbing wave, our oh, unshadowy dream of fear and hate, was stern awakening as the grave. Yet though the white man spurned your race and deemed ye frame of better clay, there waits a sure and narrow place where all his glory fades away. And those grey boughs that sadly wave over the dead sons of want and care, alike shall shade the stranger a grave, and he and they will be equal there. Now obviously the kind of Christian humanitarian sentiments come through in this particular poem. But again, there's a recognition of the complicity of settlers within the supposed um, passing of the um, First Nations, the original sovereign owners of the soil. Another example, the last of his tribe. Uh, again, the similar kind of sentiments about how it is that um, passing uh, is, is inevitable, sad, 
melancholic. And interestingly, again, of all that life held dear bereft, what boon had the white man's kindness left? A blanket as cover, a brazen plate in mockery of his falling state? And the fire drink in which he sought in vain to find oblivion from want and pain, the visions of lone departed days seemed to pass like shadows before his gaze. And the ghosts of those comrades long ago rose and beckoned to him from the vale below. Now, I could go on, I think, and, and, and give other examples, but you can see that there is a kind of way in which there's a sort of complexity of seeking variously to understand what is happening. Is, it, uh, is the cause of the supposed passing of um, First Nations settler aggression? Is it their own incapacity for improvement somehow? Is it providence working through natural law? What is the cause, nation? How are we to come to terms with this? He stood alone within the forest shade, sole remnant of a tribe long passed away. The summer air breathed softly through the glade, and midst the leaves the locust sang its lay. And here, further on, but now the white man held the natives right, pressed down their graves with harsh, unfeeling tread, and in the furrow which, which the plowshare bright turned up sad relics of the heroic dead. Now, I hasten to add, this is not the, the most um, polished or gifted of verse, um, but nonetheless, it's uh, really, uh, I think, really very kind of interesting. In the insights, it gives us the complexities of responses within settler society to what is believed, erroneously, of course, um, to the passing of First Nations. And I finish with this one here, which actually comes from um, the diaries and papers of Daniel Matthews. It's a little bit hard to read, and actually is is inspired um, by um, the horrendous death of a man working on a a, a station for for a, an appallingly brutal and violent station owner. But it's one that kind of strikes to me, uh, speaks to me at any rate. Hark, I did hear a sound as if from the ground, coming from yonder mound, where lies the black fellow. O oh God, avenge my blood on him who madly stood on my poor dying clod, though I'm a black fellow. Well, I'm going to leave it there because I think um, it's time, I think, to kind of open it up to some commentary or questions rather than um, continue um, to give myself uh, the chance to speak more about this um, but I hope to do so in the near future and, and to be able to um, present these findings um, in a perhaps more, a little bit more coherent way. And I also uh, should add of course that as, as, as Luke said at the beginning we, we have to grapple I guess with the language of the 19th century um, and one of the kind of difficult things I guess in coming to terms with our colonial past is indeed um, the need to encounter, to, to, to encounter um, or the, 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 and, and, and negotiate uh, our way sensitively around um, the language of the time, which thankfully um, is now lost in the tide of time. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, uh, as Professor Turnbull mentioned, we do have uh, time for some questions now from the audience. Uh, as we are recording this presentation, we would ask that you wait for the microphone to reach you before asking your question. Uh, we do have a question from our online audience that I'll, uh, I'll start off with and give you all an opportunity to warm up your questions. Uh, and Paul, on yep. your mic pack, we need to Turn switch on. that on. Oh, okay, it wasn't on. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought it was. Is that, is that on now? I don't think so. All right. We'll get that sorted shortly. Okay. And well, we'll take the first question here. Uh, so the first question here, uh, which has come from our live stream, uh, I'm currently working on a master's thesis focusing on the expression of identity in colonial Australian cemeteries. Among other things, I'm very interested in examining how First Nations people were buried in European-style cemeteries. What names were they given? What style of monument, if any, did they use? I'm also trying to identify why some First Nations people were buried within Christian cemeteries while others were buried outside the boundaries of the same cemeteries, uh, which you did touch on uh, earlier. Uh, I'd be incredibly grateful for the opportunity to discuss this with you in person somehow. Yeah, um, 
Thank you. It's actually it's a, it's a very, very good question and one that um, I, I guess as much exercised me over, over the time that I've been here. Um, and also recently, um, because I've been involved with the Australian South Sea Islanders Association um, in Queensland, who are in currently in, in the process of um, seeking out their ancestors who are buried in the so-called heathen section of cemeteries in Queensland um, in order to give them the proper headstones, the proper memory memorialization that they never had. It's an interesting question, I think, um, and one which really deserves greater exploration. Um, the, the recent report, um, going back, published a few years ago by Heather Goodall and, and people talking uh, about the situation in, in, in western New South Wales, um, out at near Coloranabri, where um, there is you know, quite a long history of continuity in the way that um, the memorialization of, of First Nation peoples within the cemetery those graves have been cared for and looked after um, and continue to be cared and looked after by um, the First Nation communities of, of the region and descendants of those people. Um, and, and I think there's a kind of interesting um, study to be done, I guess, which I'm, I'm, I'm kind of beginning to sense, where for a very long period after dispossession, people do try to, to, to maintain um, the graves of, of peoples who are buried within white cemeteries. Some, luckily enough, are, 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 are interred and memorialised. Um, but sadly, too, what we find is that the, the standard practice um, of authorities in the colonial era, of course, is to just bury um, First Nation peoples in the so-called you know, black section of the cemetery, uh, many, of, many of which are, are now subject to... Um, um, erosion or, or are being encroached upon um, by the, 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 the spread of you know, kind of div urban development and, and probably we, we, we do need to kind of think I think about this and whether in fact um, you know within the process of, of, of reconciliation that we, we, we do more in this direction so I'd love to talk to you about this at some stage and, and, and the library has my um, my email address um, you can you can probably find the email address on, on the web easily enough and it'd be great great to talk about that and I think I've got some things to learn from you as well, whoever you are. Uh, thanks Paul, that was a really interesting paper. Um, the poetry you quoted and uh, the illustrative material you used there I think sort of shows that in the colonial period there was a really clear understanding that there was an act of dispossession, yeah. um, that the colonisers weren't kidding anybody, they knew what they were doing, and um, that, it, that it, people were well aware of about what happened. And, and that runs it a little bit counter to the, the kind of uh, the empty land or terra nullius idea that sometimes we hear about, that, that, that Europeans were, uh, were, were, had, a, had a strong view that this was um, an empty place. Um, and I'm just interested how you, I, I think perhaps later on that, that mythology became stronger in, in, in the colonisers' mindset, but just your reflection on, on what, what are the implications of, of how um, European settlers were so aware of exactly what was going on, and of course that made some feel uncomfortable and others feel that's part of the, the, um, the, broad, the broad movement of, of European history, and of course in Europe, is it countless invasions and conquests, so they sort of thought it was more of a norm. But I just sort of wonder how you, how we should process that 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 very strong consciousness of, of what was going on amongst the colonial set settlers at the time. That's that's a really really good question, isn't it? And, and a thing to meditate on. Um, when when, not, oh, I, I forget when it was, but I I, I remember reading some. Um, arguments by some, um, I have to confess I read Quadrant, you know, I think it's one of the things that kind of keeps me alive. And, um, you know, Quadrant kind of always ran this line about, oh, you know, this, this whole thing about terra nullius, nobody ever talked about terra nullius in the 19th century, this is all a fiction, da-di-da-di-da. -da -da -da. 
And uh, interestingly enough, I went back to, to have a look, thanks to Trove, to actually look at the way that terms like, um, you know, terra nullius, res nullius actually turn up in these debates. And of course it doesn't. Um, the debate is about the legitimacy of occupation and that, you know, ultimately it boils down to, a, to almost a kind of Lockean argument about um, rights to, to um, you know, occupation on the basis of, of, of ability to improve, as it were, which, which is a view which, you know, finds its, its quintessential expression in John Locke um, and, and, you know, can be found in, in, in American discourse on the dispossession of First, um, First Nations in, in North America. And I think you, you, you find the same thing here, that there's, there's um, um, you know, a kind of very similar kind of debate um, goes on about the legitimacy or otherwise. And, and, and much of the debate, you know, kind of hinges around questions like, well, you know, are First Nations capable of, of improvement in, in the European state? I mean, you know, the, 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 you know, the usual thing is to sort of say, well, is the test of native title should be, is, is agriculture practised? Um, are there permanent dwellings? I mean, so there's this kind of very obviously long and deep Eurocentric uh, account of, 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 of how you, 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 you legitimate occupation. And, and so it's it's kind of the idea that somehow there's this, you know, and, and this feeds into the arguments about, well, there, there are no real structures of institutional governance, et cetera, et cetera. Which, but I think that doesn't come from any kind of sense of terra nullius so much as a, a, a debate which has been long going on within within the whole process of, 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 of British colonisation, which can be traced back, you know, obviously to the, the charter companies in, in, in North America. The, the issue, I think, what I find interesting um, is something which almost parallels what um, I argued with regards to scientific um, plundering of the Aboriginal dead. Um, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's been a tendency to actually sort of say, oh, this was all pseudoscience. Oh, this was, you know, they were trying to prove indigenous inferiority. Um, and this is why they did it. Um, they wanted to justify taking the land. Um, well, no. When you kind of look at it, you find that there's um, a, a very disturbing relationships between scientific ambitions and, and colonial aggression. But it can't be seen simply in terms of science being the kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the handmaiden of colonial dispossession. Or, or you know, it, 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 It's the case that, you know, when, when people say to me, well, why do they do it? The first thing I, I, I say is, well, the tenure. Um, that in a sense, it's, it's, science is prepared to capitalise uh, on, on the, the ability to, to secure remains, um, but it's science. It's the, it's the mainstream science of the day. It's, it's, not, it's not pseudoscience. It's not something out there. It's, it's, it's actually, you know, it's, it's people like um, Thomas Henry Huxley. You know, it's, it's people who are at the vanguard, as it were, of um, the development of, of, of human evolutionary studies in the 19th century. What you also find, too, is that there's a moral debate about this. Um, is it right to go around um, plundering graves for, for, for scientific purposes? And, and you get a, a difference of opinion. Now, I think there's a sem similar kind of thing in, in terms of which rises up when you look at the, 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 the encounters with the indigenous dead that it raises these issues about the legitimacy of what's happened. Um, and it's an attempt to try to come to terms which, what, with, with what is, for many people, a very, a very distressing thing. And, 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 and it seems to me that, that there there are parallels between then and now. You know, the debate, I mean, Henry Reynolds has made this point when, when he's talked about Christian humanitarians in the 19th century, and, and, and you know, he, he, he points out that, in a sense, we, we have our counterparts in the 19th century. Sure, there are significant differences, but those debates are there, and they're uncomfortable debates in lots of instances. There, there are debates which some people can easily kind of resolve, like you get people today who will resolve it, I mean... You know, you can think of politicians, for example, who, you know, um, who who think it's it's quite easy to resolve these these issues, and and, and um, you know, uh, and some of those are appalling uh, arguments, which almost echo the, the 19th century. But I think that's the issue. That the lesson to be learned from this 
is that these debates have, have, have always been there. The question is, how do we progress them? Do, do, we, do we fall into that kind of elegiac sentimentalism and the attraction, for example, of thinking that it's all providential, that it's all to do you know, with, with the, the, the inevitability of, of, of some design of civilization or, or some workings of natural law or you know, something that was inevitable, regretfully though it may have been. And, and what lessons does that have for us today when we confront... Um, you know, the demands of First Nations for a serious voice which may be constitutionally enshrined? Do we, you know, kind of shy away from that? And, and you know, I mean, how, how do we handle that? Or do, do we kind of fall back now that we're having that, you know, that, that, that debate is, is occurring today? And I, I think looking at the past like that, sees that we, the, these issues have always been with us. And in the past, perhaps, you know, um, we, we have something to learn from, from the failures which ultimately were connected to things like the, 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 um, the ongoing um, movement to, to protectionism, to, to assimilation. I don't know. I mean, but it seems to me that you're asking a very good question. Which kind of, you know, kind of really just shows that we've we've got a very complicated past that kind of near, you know, really gives us some resources for some very serious debates, I think, about and hopefully some very fruitful debates about how we how we how we move forward. So I mean, that's a long answer, but it's, it's, you've got me struggling there actually because it's a it's a good point. It's a very good point. Uh, thanks, Paul. Just to uh, jump off from that, yep. um, I enjoyed your talk. I enjoy what you're doing. In the National Library, and you've talked a lot about the value of the National Library collections yep. represent uh, what the National Library has traditionally collected. What, what would happen if you were to... Could you engage with Indigenous sources of knowledge around burial spaces and places and, and um, memories and oral histories to amplify what you're trying to do? And, and yep. is that something you've thought about doing? I, I have actually. I, I spent. I squirrelled away a few hours last week to write an application to 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 engage in that that very topic. I mean, I've been blessed over the last ten years of working in in the context of of, of what is now the reconcile, return, reconcile, renew. Um, there was a network, we're now a centre at ANU, and 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 that that's kind of brought with it a wealth of testimony to the importance of repatriation. But I think what's also come out of that is is, is the importance of, of capturing, um, you know, this I, I, again a, a kind of long history to do with the memorialisation of First Nations, um, and it's it, it's it's ongoing importance. So yeah, I mean, I I would love to see. I'd love to do more of that work, and I, I you know, God willing, I intend to. Um, uh, but you know what I've been told so far, and and, I, and I'm. You know, as I say, I'm blessed to be able to kind of um, have research, indigenous research partners who, who've been prepared to talk about these things to, to a great degree and far more eloquently than I ever could. Um, yeah, I think we'll do it. The real worry I have, of course, is does the National Library have the resources to do it? You know, I mean, this is... I, I touched on this to begin with, but I, I do think that our cultural institutions at, at a crucial time... You know, I mean, when you think of um, repatriation, for example, and its importance, and the people who were involved in really the first successfully organised campaigning of the 1970s, a lot of them are not with us any longer. And they, in many instances, are the people who were told by their parents and their grandchildren about how it was that the graves had their horses run over. Um, and I, I think we really do need to, you know, ideally, you know, something for younger scholars, I suspect, too, you know, because, yeah. But good question, good question. Thank you, Paul. Um, I was wondering whether you had come across any evidence, and I, it seems like your research is in early stages, yeah. um, as to whether there was any palisading on um, when 
uh, First Nations burial sites were discovered yeah. on land that um, was later settled. There, there are a couple of examples. Hello, Margie. Yeah. <laughs> um, good, good to see you. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of examples that are actually happening. I, this is very early days, but I have this kind of wild idea um, that there is... There may be some continuities as you go forward with the development of heritage legislation in, in the 20th century, the, the, the first attempts to create so-called relics acts um, and the kind of informal protections which are offered to places of significance. And it's not just burial places, but borer um, areas and ceremonial areas. That there, there, there is a history there to, to be told. And, and, you know, yeah... I, there are one or two concrete examples that I've, I've, I've come across. Um, and also more recent examples. I mean, this is the interesting thing that, um, you know, the, the, in the um, folks up at Fitzroy Crossing, for example, the river has kind of eroded the so-called, you know, the place where, where, where the, the local traditional owner has been buried. And they've been relocated, and there's a big kind of attempt now to, to actually identify who they are, because um, they were never identified before, and to, to kind of give them, you know, the, the, the decent um, resting places that they've long deserved. So it's, it's a kind of thing that was happening at the time, uh, and I've got one or two pieces of it, but interestingly it's something which, um, you know, there seems to be in, in a number of communities now a desire to kind of do that now. Um, as well, but it's early days, and, and I don't know how much you'll find of this recorded because a lot of these things, you come across them by accident. I mean, you know, the, the the one that always struck me was to be up at the Greenvale, the old Greenvale station in North Queensland, where, um, you know, one of the people who who was on Greenvale um, sort of took me to the local cemetery there, and, and there you find that there's no real differentiation between. You know the, the 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 whites manager family owners of, of the station, and and then the memorialisation of, of of stockmen from the uh, Gugu Garden people who 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 worked up there, so much so that in in some instances they're actually given the surname of of the family, uh, and and buried um, almost well in one, one instance actually next to members of the family, so it's you know you find you find these surprising things, but. Um, I think the difficulty is that you know you you, you, that you don't always find them in the records, as you don't find a lot of um, important First Nation history in, in in the conventional records. Unless there's any other last questions, I can escape. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Turnbull, again. Um, thank you for sharing particularly the importance around that spiritual and uh, cultural connection. And I think that conflict uh, that colonisation uh, caused, there is a, a lot more to be had in that conversation. Um, as we draw to a close uh, today, a couple of quick plugs before we leave. I uh, hope you can join us for our next fellowship lecture uh, by Dr Sagata Nandi, titled Spiritualist West, Magical Orient. Theosophists and India from 1875 to 1950, uh, which will be on Thursday the 27th of October. Uh, our website, the National Library of Australia website, is the place where you'll be able to find recordings of our very interesting and very diverse recent talks and performances from our fellows. And these are also available on our YouTube channel as well. If you'd like to know more about some of our formed collections, uh, such as the ones that Professor Turnbull uh, has been using, uh, please search the guide to our collections, which is available on our website. Uh, I'd again like to thank uh, the Stokes family and our other uh, generous philanthropic supporters who make these fellowships possible. Uh, thank you all for attending, uh, either in person or online, uh, and please join me uh, once again in congratulating Professor Turnbull for today's uh, thought-provoking presentation. Thank you.